Weight Watchers. They're probably one of the biggest companies behind the diet industry, and therefore they're responsible, backed by science, and have proven long lasting results, right? Well, between their multiple settlements with the FTC, their programs for literal eight-year-old children, and their controversial point system, Weight Watchers may not be the best example to follow in the diet industry, though more people argue for their system than you might think. Hello everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today I'm going to weigh in on the company Weight Watchers. And I'm not apologizing for that pun. You can't make me. Now, before we get into the thick of it, I wanna make sure that I have this disclaimer put up right here in the beginning that we're gonna be talking about disordered eating throughout the episode. I also want to state upfront that I don't believe weight is the only measure of health. The reason I'm so focused on the topic of weight loss in today's episode is because we're talking about Weight Watchers and how many have argued that this is the company's sole focus. Yet Weight Watchers has also reinvented themselves lately, claiming to care about well-being and taking on the new simplified name of Wait for it, WW. Even so, tens of thousands of people are so opposed to the new Weight Watchers that they've signed a petition against them. More specifically, people are upset by Kerbo, their weight loss app for children. As you could imagine, without much elaboration, how could this go terribly wrong? Since eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness, this app has the potential to literally kill people if it isn't taken seriously or removed. It certainly makes matters all the worse that the app is allegedly teaching little kids to diet and instilling questionable, if not dangerous behaviors. A variety of sources and eating disorder or ED counselors have claimed that Weight Watchers encourages disordered eating by overriding your ability to focus on your own hunger, fullness, and satiety. Additionally, it can lead to these dangerous practices by eliminating certain foods for the sake of health and by giving participants a negative relationship with food. Kerbo has been heavily criticized for this and doctors interviewed by NBC said that this approach has just opened another door into the development of eating disorders as a whole. But how true is this? Is Weight Watchers just trying to teach us all healthy habits and they've been misunderstood? Or are they backed by questionable science? Let's try and answer that question because unfortunately the answer is a bit more complicated than you might think. Weight Watchers is one of the most recognized and well-known weight loss organizations out there, and they've been around for decades. Jean Nittich founded the company back in the 1960s, and from the very start, she wanted to back up her diet plan with science. Encyclopedia.com states that she picked up a copy of a program recommended by the New York City Department of Health Obesity Clinic and used it as a guide. It was called the Prudent Diet. However, aside from the black and white recommendations, Jean also went to her friends and asked them how they approached their diet in order to get a better feel for how women around her lost the weight and kept it off. I was able to actually find the prudent diet online, which seemed to be effective. This wasn't just a fad diet for people that you know they did back in the day. This seemed to actually have tangible real life effects. Some studies were finding that women who followed this low cholesterol and prudent method were at a 24% lower risk of coronary artery disease. And when paired with regular exercise, that risk could be lessened by 83%. Although Jean was focused primarily on women, the diet also benefited male participants as well. They found a 13% lower mortality rate among them. All of this data comes from a study with over 3000 participants spanning across 20 years. This isn't some 10 person study over a few weeks like we see with MLMs. The results from studies like these are far more credible, even if they're not perfect. Jean too thrived on this diet and she found that she was more motivated when she had the support of her peers. She established meetings among her friends, sometimes having 40 people at her apartment each week to talk about their weight loss journey. Weight Watchers officially began in 1963 and by 1966, the first Weight Watchers cookbook was published. Within a couple more years, Weight Watchers was thriving. The book had sold more than a million copies and as an organization, it expanded to over a million members. 15 years after forming, Weight Watchers was worth $71 million and H.J. Hines bought it up. In today's dollars, that would be about 462 million. So about halfway towards a billion dollar company. Weight Watchers truly began to grow along with diet culture. They created Quick Start in the 1980s, which was aimed at speeding up weight loss within the first couple weeks of dieting. And for me, this is where I start to get a bit skeptical. Although I'm not a nutritionist or dietitian of any sort, but when the goal here is to lose weight as fast as possible, as we've seen with other diet and wellness companies previously, it feels like sustainability and long-term health take a backseat. The goal should be, in my opinion at least, to lose weight sustainably, not quickly. And you know, to consider your overall health, not just in the short term, but in the long term as well. But this quick start method seems to be devoid of that type of logic or reasoning. 
Even so, they did see unprecedented growth between 1982 and 1989, thanks to frozen food entrees, desserts, their well-received magazine, and more. By 1988, they were officially a billion dollar business. Other well-known competitors like Jenny Craig and Nutrisystem also emerged around this time as the diet industry saw rapid expansion. Though not everything was sunshine and rainbows for them either. In 1993, the FTC would set their eyes on Weight Watchers, eventually moving in to file suit for deceptive advertising. They accused Weight Watchers of running advertisements that used deceptive customer testimonials about weight loss maintenance that the company couldn't back up. Just like their competitors facing similar suits at the time, Weight Watchers eventually settled. Though don't worry, this isn't the only time we'll be hearing from the FTC today. In 1998, Weight Watchers unveiled their famous or infamous, depending on who you ask, point system, known as the 123 success points plan. According to Funding Universe, this stemmed from customers being tired of counting calories and the industry taking a downturn. Weight Watchers needed to reinvent themselves. And this is also where things would start to become really controversial. Some critics say that this particular point system was the easiest to follow and Weight Watchers has only become more complicated and reliant on calories over the recent years. Their system went through even more drastic shifts in 2010. Elizabeth Claudis, MD of One Step Foods stated that Weight Watchers not only tracked calories, but began to consider the composition of those calories too, like their fat, protein, fiber, and carbs. This was rational from a weight loss perspective, but not so much from an overall health perspective. And as the article explains, it meant that an apple and two small cookies were worth the same amount of points. Any sugars or foods deemed not good for you looked to be heavily discouraged to a point of contention. Then the method was changed again in 2015 when the point system became smart points, encouraging more fruits and vegetable intake, as well as the reduction in added sugars. Oprah also became a spokesperson for Weight Watchers around this time. They'd had 10 straight quarters of declining sales and Oprah was their pivot point. This pillar of self-love and beloved figure who has her very own episode with us was their savior in that regard. In 2017, they also introduced a freestyle program which markets all of their zero point foods like beans, peas, and corn, even further adding a lot of different fish as well as turkey, skinless chicken, shellfish, crab, and lobster to the list. Claudus called this a giant misstep for Weight Watchers because it makes the concept of points irrelevant and complicates the entire process of eating for weight loss. It's also confusing because, well, if someone wanted to eat an entire roast chicken without the skin, they could, and it wouldn't cost them any points. A three egg omelet with smoked salmon, good to go. Plus, now you have a bunch of points left over for that sleeve of Oreos, Claudus added. The points approach taken by Weight Watchers may allow someone to have the all healthy zero point foods they want, but it's grouping all these foods like roast chicken and broccoli together, despite them not necessarily having the same effect or benefit on your body. Now, of course, One Step Foods is biased as they're a company within the diet industry too, and a competitor of Weight Watchers. Regardless of bias though, I do believe Claudus makes a good point. The point method does sound a bit confusing. So let's try to answer the important question here. Does it work? Now, let me put a giant disclaimer right here and say that the efficacy of Weight Watchers has been highly debated and different sources can say completely opposite things. If it's worked for you, that's fantastic. And by no means are they the worst diet system I've covered. As I looked into them, I have to admit, I'm mildly surprised I didn't find far worse, but I'm going to attempt to present both sides here. So first and foremost, let's get to what Weight Watchers claims they can do for you. Primarily, Weight Watchers states that they aren't a yo-yo diet. In other words, you aren't just going to bounce around, never finding a long-term diet or regime that works for you. The diet industry has been accused of keeping people overweight and not offering sustainability to retain customers in the past. Calorie counting, good and bad fats, and restrictive eating all can lead to an obsession with weight itself that doesn't necessarily help people in the long run. And Weight Watchers, given the fact that they had weight in their name, have been accused of contributing to this. Around the same time that Oprah joined Weight Watchers as a spokesperson, Slate stated that it was the perfect venture for her, not because Weight Watchers works, but because it doesn't. Quote, it's the perfect business model. People give Weight Watchers the credit when they lose the weight. Then they regain the weight and blame themselves. This sets them up to join Weight Watchers all over again, and they do. The evidence Slate has to back this up comes from one of Weight Watchers own business plans in which they said that their members demonstrated a consistent pattern of repeat enrollment. Now, of course, to some extent, it makes sense that re-enrollment would occur. 
If someone is on a long-term diet weight loss journey that involves Weight Watchers, then they'd probably have to sign up multiple times if their enrollment were to expire. However, the implication here is that customers have become dependent on Weight Watchers, which isn't really healthy either. The idea of you'll fail without us is such a dangerous mentality to have. And in my opinion, is just setting people up for failure, disappointment, and lots of self-loathing. None of those are healthy for someone on an actual literal health journey. Author Tracy Mann also referenced a study in this article, which stated the average dieter would regain about half the weight they lost after a couple years, demonstrating that Weight Watchers wasn't effective in the long term. She also referenced an article in the New York Times Magazine called The Fat Trap, which expressed how dangerous diet culture had become and how impossible it would be for consumers to keep weight off for more than a few months. In response to this, a professor of psychiatry and human behavior at Brown University's Albert Medical School, Rena Wing, set up the National Weight Control Registry. It tracks 10,000 people who have lost weight and kept it off. Some were Weight Watchers customers, some have tried the Atkins diet, and others have even had surgery. But those that truly maintained their weights had to change their lifestyle and habits, something that Weight Watchers didn't necessarily offer if you're reliant on their point system. This doesn't mean someone using their program can't change their habits by any means, but it does seem like that's what the company or diet culture as a whole is about in the first place. Articles from Psychology Today even suggested the opposite. Therapist Carrie Anderson, who works with women who have disordered eating, said that Oprah's headline about her diet made her heart sink. How I lost 42 and a half pounds with Weight Watchers. As Anderson explains, the focus on the numbers can be damaging and Oprah, who told the world exactly how she ate 30 points a day, counted out the 11 chips she allowed herself as a snack and gave herself cheesy scalp potatoes as a Christmas present. But parading this around as a marketing tool is really only reinforcing this restrictive diet culture even further. Not to mention, Weight Watchers boasts about how you can eat whatever you want as long as you follow the point system. So then why are people bragging about giving themselves their favorite meals as Christmas presents and how they haven't eaten a pizza in five years on the system? Those two things feel extremely contradictory to me. Plus, why have someone weigh in every single week if it's about slow progress and health? The idea of needing to have that number also really bothers me. A Livestrong article by Barbara Arfiero also criticized their system. They mentioned that the point system could lead to vitamin deficiency and undernourishment, stating that if you eat their 250 to 300 calorie frozen meals, you may not reach the average intake of 2000 calories. Undernourishment can actually slow down your metabolism and just make it all the harder to lose weight. Plus, obviously, it's really just not that healthy to begin with. Then again, it's not all bad. I also do wanna be fair to Weight Watchers and present the negative and the positive here. So let's take a look at those who have actually praised them. Kimberly Goodzone, an assistant professor of medicine and weight loss specialist at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine praised Weight Watchers in terms of helping people lose weight. In their program, as well as Jenny Craig's, participants lost an average of three to 5% more than control groups. However, very few of these studies lasted a year or more. So this doesn't actually measure long-term results. Nutritionists also gave their opinions on the website Cron, and they had quite a few positive things to say. From how the Weight Watchers weekly meetings and support groups will hold participants accountable. They offer structure, small attainable goals, and seem better at making healthy eating as part of an everyday lifestyle, according to Rebecca Slayton, a registered dietitian with a master of science in food and nutrition. Newsweek also published a compilation of studies that support Weight Watchers. One from 2011 found advice from your doctor may not be enough, and those that joined Weight Watchers could lose twice as much weight in a year compared to those that just followed a physician's advice. And personally, I found this wording a little bit alarming. Newsweek stated that though physician counseling is considered standard care, it may not be the most effective. Are they implying that you should do Weight Watchers instead? Because before you join any diet program, you should talk to your doctor. Now, I could be just reading too much into this, but considering that this is a sponsored post, I wish Weight Watchers would have been more careful with their wording here, but let's move on. As some of you may know, Weight Watchers has gotten a makeover recently and they don't even go by that name anymore. Instead, they're now just WW. So what's changed aside from the name? In 2018, Weight Watchers became WW and added the tagline, wellness that works. Erica Nicole Kendall, a nutritionist, personal trainer, and writer had quite a few things to say about this. You thought that removing the word weight was just going to be this mind blowing thing for all of us. And we were just going to feel differently about this brand? No, no, it's still the same thing. But my second thought was finally, the body acceptance movement got a win. In essence, Weight Watchers seemingly knew that they couldn't be as embroiled in diet culture as they'd become. Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, Nutrislim, for years, these guys all presented themselves about being about shedding pounds and presenting thinness. 
And while that worked for a while, the mindsets have changed and shifted to adding more value on wellness and health as opposed to just a number on the scale. And Weight Watchers had to go along with it. Some called this an obvious desperate move, but a pitiful one. You can't drop the weight from Weight Watchers, Virginia Soul Smith, a contributor to the New York Times stated. In addition, they also created a new holistic program, MyWW+, which is supposed to help with more than just weight, but physical activity, mental health, and sleep. Finally, right? WW actually cares about health and not just weight. Well, that's except for the fact that they still require those weigh-ins. So how much change were they actually implementing? While some reporters found the new name stupid and laughable, others saw it as a ridiculous attempt to stay on brand. And there are those that called it diet culture in disguise or insidious. Basically, WW is using wellness as a buzzword for profits. If they actually cared about wellness alone, why require the weigh-ins? If they care about being sustainable, why isn't there more proof about their point system truly working in the long term? It didn't feel like any of the important and potentially damaging parts of Weight Watchers had actually been replaced, especially for those that claimed Weight Watchers had genuinely hurt them. Kelly Spears claimed that when she joined Weight Watchers when she was 20 years old and she attended Monday night meetings religiously. They fed into her perfectionist tendencies as she wrote down everything she ate, determining success by the number on the scale. Kelly claims that she even became a Weight Watch leader at one point and supervisors pulled her aside when she gained weight, telling her that as a leader, she had a standard to uphold. She felt guilty and began a cycle of counting, tracking points, binging, feeling guilty, restricting food intake, exercising compulsively, and then spiraling downwards. As it turned out, Kelly had polycystic ovarian syndrome as well, which contributed to her weight gain. And she needed real help for her eating disorder, not to be held accountable to a number on a scale. People used to tell me that Weight Watchers isn't a diet, but it is. I back that statement by explaining that the program encourages its members to focus on external goals and cues rather than trusting and honoring their bodies. Any program that focuses on weight control has rules is indeed a diet. So as long as Weight Watchers is demanding we be held accountable to a number on a scale, I don't think they can argue that they're solely focused on wellness. And as of writing this on their FAQ page, WW states that lifetime members have to weigh in every month. And if they weigh more than their weight goal at the first monthly weigh-in, you'll be charged a weekly fee until you're back within your goal range. Unless I'm misunderstanding, they'll charge you, hold you financially accountable for not losing weight. How can anyone say this is anything but a diet? And why is this considered wellness? Progress, be it weight loss or mental health or anything in between, isn't always a straight line. You're going to have your ups and downs. And to be frank here, because I feel like it's not said enough, that's completely normal. Now, obviously, just as there are anecdotal stories about how harmful WW is, there's also going to be stories about how fantastic their diet is. And I don't doubt that WW works for some folks. Eating disorders are complicated and can mean different things to different people. While I don't want to say that WW causes them, I do personally feel that they exacerbate them at times and are disingenuous by saying that they're not a diet when they so clearly are. Unfortunately though, things do get much worse. Regardless of if you've disagreed with everything I've presented thus far, there's one thing that we can hopefully all agree on. Don't push diet cultures onto children. Well, Weight Watchers doesn't seem to get that message. In addition to all the wellness changes, Weight Watchers began marketing towards children. They created Kerbo, a color-coded weight loss app designed for eight to 17 year olds that has a green light for good foods, yellow for proceed with caution, and red foods that you should eat sparingly. Is telling your child to eat healthy a good thing? Yeah, absolutely. But putting them on a diet has other severe implications. A registered dietitian nutritionist, Christy Harrison, wrote an op-ed for the New York Times all about this, stating that parents should keep this away from their children. For one, there's not a lot of research into kids and weight loss, but much of the research that does exist suggests that interventions only produce small short-term reductions in weight. A 2017 systemic review of such studies reads, The overall quality of the evidence for weight loss in kids was low or very low, and 62 trials had a high risk of bias. These are the same studies that Kerbo suggests support their company and business model. Not to mention, pushing diets on kids can absolutely lead to disordered eating, which is already extremely common in minors. About 55% of high school girls and 30% of boys have reported fasting, taking diet pills, vomiting, abusing laxatives, or other forms of harmful weight loss practices. And if I can just insert myself here for a moment, I was absolutely one of those kids in high school that was begging my mom to buy me diet pills and and I was vomiting. I was doing all sorts of just horrific things to myself in high school because I couldn't stand the fact that I wasn't stick thin and that I must've been broken or it didn't work right or I was like the most hideous thing on planet earth. 
And for the record, I'm 5'9", and at the time I had weighed about 170 pounds. And when I looked in the mirror, I couldn't tell. I thought I was the ugliest thing to ever see. And it's something that from that time period in my life has followed me throughout my life and actually is part of the reason that prevented me from getting a diagnosis because I assumed it was just me just hating on myself and that what was happening to me wasn't actually a reaction of something more serious. So I'm happy I'm getting taken care of my health now, but this shit really fucks you up as a kid and I can personally attest to it. So the question is here, shouldn't we be helping these kids break out of dangerous habits as opposed to giving them new ways to diet that just seemingly aren't proven? WW says this is about wellness, but again, if they are, then this app comes off as extremely tone deaf. Harrison states that while WW says Kerbo is a holistic tool instead of a diet, the app itself is literally labeling some foods as a no-go. This leads her to call it a fertile ground for disordered eating, along with other apps like it. Not to mention, kids who've joined Weight Watchers in the past have obsessed over food and developed eating disorders. I don't want to say that WW caused it, but numerous adults such as Sophia Carter Kahn have made accusations themselves. Intuitive eating or understanding your body's cues is linked to better health outcomes than diets. And as Harrison says, we need to start teaching kids to trust their own inner wisdom about food. And we need to help them make peace with their bodies at any size. Of course, Harrison wasn't the only critic by any means. The Center for Discovery posted an article about how these red light foods could create guilt, shame, and potentially disordered eating. Plus the app only required parental consent if you're under 13. So teenagers don't need their parents' consent to sign up. Now, of course, it's also possible to just lie and say you're 18 or have parental consent with a click of a button on most apps anyway, but for WW to not even attempt a barrier to entry is pretty telling. Instilling good behaviors is different than forbidding foods and dieting. WW doesn't seem to recognize that. This led to an absolute Twitter takeover and mass criticism of WW in 2019 when the hashtag wake up Weight Watchers was trending during Eating Disorder Awareness Week. It even garnered more attention than the hashtag eating disorder awareness hashtag itself. And for the record, other diet companies have also tried to do this kind of stuff. It's not as if Kerbo is the first problematic app. However, the reason why I think people went after Weight Watchers so hard is because for one, they're a gigantic company. They are extremely well known, so they set an example for other diet companies to follow. Two is how WW had just rebranded on the platform of wellness. Advertising this as wellness is pretty apparently utter bullshit. Three is that they can easily afford to do better. And given the research capabilities and options they have to produce new research, and given their history of younger members claiming to have like said that these programs caused eating disorders in the past, like they owed that to their customers to be transparent and honest. And they just clearly didn't do that. But regardless about how you feel about the app or even anything else we've discussed so far, the next thing that Kerbo did or was discovered doing is 100% inexcusable. According to the FTC, the Kerbo app illegally collected data from these users. As we just said, it can be incredibly easy to sign up for an app or website by saying you're a certain age and little kids could just claim to be over 13 to get this app without their parents' permission. But the scummy thing is how Weight Watchers is also taking user data, names, birth dates, and email addresses from these kids. WW stated that this was just to help them lose weight, but I also kind of fail to see how an email address is going to help do that. In fact, I fail to see why they thought this app was even remotely a good idea. They went against professional advice about targeting kids for weight loss, such as a 2016 report from the American Association of Pediatrics that literally discourages parents from discussing weight loss. They also made it extremely easy for a kid to lie about their age and sign up for this app, even if they were under the age of 13. And of course, they illegally collected data through Kerbo. So who exactly greenlighted this? Should they have done what Kerbo does to unhealthy snacks and given it a red light instead? Well, what happened was is they did reach a settlement with the FTC in March of 2022, paying about $1.5 million, but not admitting any wrongdoing because of course not. All in all, I don't appreciate Weight Watchers, not their sponsored articles that seem to imply that they're superior to seeing a physician, not the way they target kids, nor their rebranding towards wellness when that clearly just didn't work out well. Whether they're Weight Watchers or WW, they're just a red light in my book. But hey, what do I know? I'm just one person on the internet expressing opinions based on research that we've conducted as a team here. But of course, with all this being said, that is the end of today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you didn't enjoy it, I hope you at least learned something new today. If you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I really appreciate you spending some of your time here with me today. I know you could be doing a million and a half things in the world and you chose just a couple minutes right here. So thank you for that. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye. 